People have asked, why are you doing a show about grass? And that's an excellent question. Why wouldn't I do a show about food that people are familiar with? It's the season of fruit here in the Sonoran Desert. And I'm going to walk you around my garden and show you what I have growing right now. And the grapes are just starting. In a few weeks, these are going to put out leaves. And we're going to have an amazing grape harvest here, especially with all the rain that we've been having this year. I bought these from Farmer Greg, who I'll put a link below into his website. He's pretty cool. Farmer Greg is uh, started the permaculture movement here in Phoenix probably about 15 years, 20 years ago now. We've been harvesting oranges for weeks, and this orange has been extremely productive. In fact, Phoenix used to grow massive orange orchards. Uh, in fact, when we first moved here, I lived in an orange picker's shack. Yeah, it was pretty rough. These are apple trees. This is a specific kind of apple that will have a, has low, doesn't require a lot of chill hours and will grow really well in the desert. Over here, we have fig trees. This is still coming out of winter, so the fig tree hasn't yet put out leaves, but uh, about a month, it's gonna be covered with leaves and it'll be putting out new figs. This will start putting out pomegranates in late fall, early winter, and this tree will be covered with pomegranates. Over here we have peaches. In about two months this tree is going to be covered with peaches. And up here we got lemons. Lemons is probably one of the easiest trees to grow in the desert. Uh, lemon trees, you basically put them in the ground, walk away, and within a two or three years you're going to have a tree full of lemons. Ridiculously simple. Maybe someday I'll tell you the story of how I accidentally destroyed 4,000 pounds of bananas. But, for the moment, somebody said something a few months ago that got me thinking, can we actually eat grass? And that made me go do some research. Living in the shade of giants. Then, the world began to change. So that got me into researching, which I started to realize not only do we eat grass, we primarily live off grass. As a matter of fact, like I said in the intro to the first episode, is 50% of the human diet. And I had to start breaking that down in my head. That doesn't even make sense. How would we 50% of our diet be grass? Well, when I realized it was the cereal grains, it started to make more sense. And once I started to think about grains, everything started to evolve pretty rapidly. Being the kind of person I am, I can't just talk about grass here in the moment, but I also have to talk about grass, the the trajectory of grass over time, because quite honestly, I, I think that's as interesting and absolutely critical to understanding what grass is now as to understand where grass started. Grass has kind of been around forever in that it's 100 million years old or more, 100, 110 million years old or more. They've found grass phytoliths actually in dinosaur, ancient dinosaur poop. It's uh, corpolites is the word that anthropologists like to use. It makes it sound much more dignified. But essentially they're, they're cutting little pieces of dinosaur poop and looking for evidence of grass inside of it. And they're finding it. In fact, they found quite a bit of it. But grass itself isn't yet a major player compared to the, the, the tree canopies which existed during the Miocene, absolutely shading the grass out. Before grassland started to spread, we're talking about the entire Earth, basically all land on Earth, being covered with giant forests. To truly understand how grass spreads, it required understanding the normal ec model of ecological succession which the standard model of ecological succession states that after a disturbance event, first you'll get grass, then you'll get bushes and shrubs, and they'll start to shade the grass out. And then after the bushes and shrubs, you start to get trees. And that'll further shade the grass out. And then you'll get multiple layers of canopy, so you have trees uh, shading out the trees below, which are shading out the shrubs and the, and the bushes, which are shading out the grass. So you have these layers of shade, which by the time you get to the ground level, there's really no grass. And that's when I 
realized that I had to flip the normal model of ecological succession on its head and work with it backwards. That is, I needed it dis- in order to tell the story of how grass starts to spread, I needed a disturbance event that would happen repeatedly, wiping out the bushes, the trees, th- and leaving the ground bare for grass. Now, the typical disturbance event in today's day and age, of course, is humans. We will clear a forest, and that'll open up room for grass to start to spread. But humans didn't exist 35 million years ago, unless unless the anthropologists got it very seriously wrong, and I don't think they did. So therefore, I needed an explanatory mechanism that would describe some sort of disturbance event knocking down the forest of prehistory and opening up room for grass. And then the actual story started, the actual first episode started to jump out at me. Only within the last 35 million years did these grasslands start to become prevalent. 35 million years sounds like a long time to us because we live short lifespans. But when you are considering evolutionary timescales, that's pretty recent. So I had to ask myself the very real question of what happened 35 million years ago in order for grasslands to start to expand. For grass to start to spread, something had to start wiping out the trees and the smaller trees and the bushes and the shrubs. And it turned out that mountains and rain shadows were absolutely fundamental to this formation of these new grasslands rain shadows created by these new mountains, although I don't quite understand that, because there was mountain ranges before. The only thing I can figure is the rain shadows must not have been large enough for continual expansion of grasslands. But it requires the rain shadow in order to get a dry enough area that the grass can start to burn and wipe out the trees and so on. And looking into the literature behind grass fires, it turns out the grass is actually quite successful at surviving grass fires. But in a truly wet forest, fires really won't even start. So, for example, in my reading I came across a story about jungles and fires in jungles. And really, by and large, they don't happen very often. The, 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 the forest is so damp that a fire can't get started. So it requires these rain shadows in order for the land to dry out enough that the f- grass fire can actually even begin. So suddenly I had an explanatory mechanism for which grass could start to spread. We have these mountain ranges forming and then we have rain shadows forming from the the mountain range and then we have the area drying out just enough that the disturbance event happens which is the grass fire and then it clears the area and allows grass to start growing so once i started thinking about grass the floodgates started to open i mean grass became absolutely fascinating at so many levels. For one thing, yes, of course, it makes up 50% of the human diet, but the grass itself is in this delicate balance between natural phenomena such as fire and climate and rain shadows and so on. And if those preconditions don't exist, then the grass won't spread, in which case humans wouldn't have been able to domesticate all these grasses and all these animals that live on the grass for our own survival. So check out the links below because it contain, they contain all the articles that I actually referenced for this episode. I used every bit of reference material I get my hands on, all the way from Wikipedia to peer-reviewed articles published in high-impact journals and began to synthesize this story which I found absolutely fascinating. 
Thank you for the comment from Eki Sigma X, where he says grass has an interesting evolutionary history. It does, and in an unabashed plug for my next episodes, I have three more that are already in the can, I'm in editing now, where I lay out the absolutely critical next steps for grass to reach the point where it becomes the foundation for the human food system. If grass hadn't gone through these four steps, first the, the, the rain shadows and the grass fires, and then the next three steps which are coming up, essentially we would cut our human population in half. As if we could have evolved at all without the grasslands, which is debatable, there's good reason to believe that we wouldn't be recognizably human if the grasslands hadn't gone through their expansion and diversification of different species that lived upon the grasslands. These three steps are absolutely critical to the human story and the food system as we recognize it today. And, as I started to put all this together in my own mind, suddenly, my worldview on grass started to change. Connections were coming faster and faster. How could I not do a show on grass? I see probably 20 to 25 episodes coming out of the grass story arc itself. I've already written the first five, and I'm just now getting to the Neolithic Revolution. Using grass as my entrance point, I can then segue into many modern topics in the, in the food system, such as grass-fed versus grain-fed meat, or fertilizer being used as the basis of the contemporary grain system, or herbicides is used as a way to eradicate grasses that we don't want. I see multiple story arcs emerging from this original story arc of grass. I would like to thank Linda B and Soteria A for their kind comments on YouTube. I would also like to thank the many comments that I got on my personal Facebook page and in my Instagram. If you want to follow this story, please subscribe. Rebellion Brand Power Sports Hydrating Soda has four times the amount of yummy sugar than the competition, three times the legal limit of caffeine, and is enhanced with both ephedra and kava kava so you lose weight fast.